welcome uh, to the session, Taxing Our Way to a Fairer Society. My name is Tim Black, and I write for the online magazine Spiked, and I'll be the uh, chair for this session. We've seen politicians of all uh, party political stripes rushing to condemn tax avoiders. We've seen the London mayoral election get feisty over the candidate's tax transparency. And of course, we've seen youthful radicals, UK uncut, uh, glue themselves to the windows of Topshop to protest against owner Sir Philip Green's reduced tax liability. Tax avoidance may be legal, uh, campaigners say, but it's not moral and it's not fair. But is this determination to get the wealthy to pay more tax a good thing? Will the economy really benefit from this drive to partially despoil the filthy rich? Can and should taxation be used to realise a vision of a fairer and less unequal society? Or is there a bit of bashing and blaming of the rich going on here? Indeed, is the current taxman crusade more about stigmatising certain individuals' wealth rather than increasing everybody's wealth? And should we be concerned that one's tax receipts appear to have become an index of one's moral virtue? A window into the soul, as one commentator put it. To help us explore these questions, uh, we've got a fantastic panel. Lydia Prieg, uh, researcher in finance and business at the New Economics Foundation. Uh, we then have Dominic Morris, uh, director of Group Public Affairs, Lloyds Banking Group. Then Rowena Davis, freelance journalist, political and social affairs commentator, uh, Labour, uh, Labour councillor for Southwark and the author of Tangled Up in Blue. And my far right, uh, not politically, uh, we have Rob Killick, uh, co-founder and CEO of Seascape. We have uh, Jamie White, Dr. Jamie White, Head of Research and Publishing at Oliver Wyman Financial Services. Uh, so, Lydia, if you want to start us off. I wanted to talk briefly about tax avoidance. Um, so, first of all, I wanted to, to discuss why we need to tackle tax avoidance. Um, and then I wanted to emphasize why this is particularly important, um, given that we have an economy in a recession. And finally, I wanted to throw around some ideas about how we might go about tackling tax avoidance. So firstly, why do we need to tackle it? Because trickle-down economics, so this idea that if we have a few amongst us in society who are very wealthy, that wealth will gradually feed down and, and result in everybody in society becoming more affluent. Um, there's very little data to, to back up trickle-down economics. Um, for the past sort of few decades, if you look at countries like the UK and the US, where trickle-down economics has been the basis of policy, and if you look at what's happened to incomes during that time period, what you've seen is you've seen inequality um, enormously increase. So the gap between rich to poor hugely increase, um, but real incomes of the average person actually stagnating. The general income of the average person not improving despite this huge increase at the very top. An interesting side effect of that is we've actually seen people, ordinary people, going out and getting themselves more indebted because they've been having to take out debt in order to um, sort of artificially inflate their incomes and live as if their incomes were rising. So getting taxed right at the top of society and particularly cracking down on those who are free riding and not paying their fair share um, is of critical importance. And it's particularly so during a recession now, why is this? I mean, a lot of people may have the idea that tax breaks for the rich, for example, are a good way to stimulate an economy during a recession. Now, this is actually a terrible way of stimulating an economy during a recession. What you need, particularly as in the current situation where governments are under pressure not to spend enormous amounts of money, is you need each injection of government money into the economy to multiply and to have the effect of that multiply on the economy as a whole. And in order to get that, you need the people who receive those tax breaks or receive that, that, that cash injection to go out and spend as much of it uh, as possible. And who are the people who are going to do that? Who are the people who are going to spend every additional penny they have? It's the people at lowest incomes. It's not people at the high end of the spectrum. Um, the very wealthy are much more likely to save additional money, um, and they're in particular more likely to invest it in the international capital markets. So this idea that turning a blind eye on tax avoidance or tax breaks for the rich is what we should be doing during a recession is, is particular madness. How can we go about tackling tax avoidance? 
Well, a very basic thing we can do is um, reverse the job cuts, the enormous job cuts that have happened at um, HMRC. Um, and now, this isn't actually just a result of the coalition government. Um, an enormous number of people have been made redundant, and this actually started way back in the previous Labour administration. And it's absolute madness. I mean, we talk a lot about UK PLC, um, but what kind of vaguely competent business, um, when in trouble, fires all the people in, like, the debt collection part of the company? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense at all. And there's, there's research that shows that each individual uh, tax officer brings in far more money for the exchequer than, than the cost of their incomes. But then there are also things that both the UK can do unilaterally, but also that the UK can do as part of the international community that would help tackle the source uh, of tax avoidance. So not wasting loads of energy trying to tighten up X, Y, Z loophole and playing that game of cat and mouse, but going straight to the source and saying, what can we do to tackle tax havens? Now, I probably won't have time to talk about what I think the G20 should be doing. I just want to make a brief note to say that they've made an, there's been absolutely zero political will amongst the G20 countries to date to do anything significant. If you look at sort of the, 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 comp, the meetings that happened in 2008, 2009, when they declared the era of tax haven secrecy was over, they put in place very minimal increase in standards uh, in tax havens and declared that the problem was resolved and it was an absolute whitewash. But before I um, wind up, I want to talk specifically about what the UK can be doing and about the UK's unique role in global tax avoidance. A very large percentage of the, UK, of the world's tax havens are actually UK jurisdictions. There are crown dependencies and our overseas territories. And so by that I mean like places like the Cayman Islands, um, the Isle of Man, Jersey, uh, Jersey, Guernsey. And these are places that we all have the idea they're entirely independent, autonomous jurisdictions. And that's not true. The UK government actually has the right to intervene where there is poor governance in those countries. And we've intervened in the past. So, for example, in 2009, we overthrew and suspended the government in the Turk and Caicos Islands because they were corrupt. And no one in the international community um, you know, put up their hands and said, this is outrageous, the, you know, the British state is, is, is interfering in another, another country's matter, because we have the legislative right to do so. Um, and if you speak to parliamentarians who work in this area, they acknowledge it. So we could be doing something, but we don't have the appetite to do it. I need to wrap up. So um, just to summarize, uh, you know, trickle down doesn't work. We need to think about actually getting the people at the top to pay their fair share, particularly during a recession. And there are lots of concrete things we can be doing to do that. Thank you. Well, with all due respect to David Cameron, my opening point is that theology or morality is a rubbish guide to tax policy. The scriptures give you only a limited guide, render unto Caesar which is due unto Caesar, render unto God that which is due unto God. That's about all that's said there, and wisely Jesus did not say how much was due unto either. The most you could say for it is there's an early prohibition against tax evasion. So if you've not got morality, what? I would argue not fairness. It's far too imprecise, slippery, and loaded as a concept. How about more equal, certainly in terms of opportunity, and more efficient in terms of growth? It's about a pragmatic balance. Inequality has indeed grown over the last 20 years. I disagree with Lydia's correlation between trickle-down economics. If that were true, inequality would not have grown in Germany, Sweden and France. It has, by almost the same amount as it has in the UK. It's been driven by globalisation and technology, and winner takes all. Does inequality matter? I think yes, in extremists, because you get the mob or Hugo Chavez. Probably a bad idea. Yes, because absolute inequality also leads to inequality of opportunity. There are some startling statistics from America showing how the educational gap has led America to having lower social mobility than pretty well any other European country. Surprise. Yes, because it entrenches cosy and restrictive practices. Filthy lobbyists like me are unable to change the rules of the game. It's appalling. But some measure of inequality is good for an economy. It drives hard work and it rewards innovation and enterprise. What does that tell you about a tax system? One, it needs an element of progressiveness, but the Laffer curve is real. We've had a pragmatic experiment in the UK. It's somewhere in our society today between 40 and 50p in the pound. Beware of narrowing your tax base too much. Today, the average family with two kids and one earner has to get more than 22,000 a year before they pay any tax net, and the median income in this country is 27,000. Why? Because it pushes up the rate too far on those who are left in it. It removes responsibility and disconnects a large swathe of the public from the costs of government, 
so therefore they keep adding for more because they don't know how much it costs. It encourages tax avoidance, bad thing, and the rich can leg it. Or more important, mobile companies, which constitute a very large proportion of new jobs, decide, no, we'll put it in that country, not here. What about tax avoidance? Uh, who bar me has an individual savings account? Can we be honest? Yes, yes. I bet one or two of the panellists do. Yes. You filthy tax avoiders, you. That is, it's a form of tax avoidance. And avoidance is an irregular now. My cuddly eye, sir, is your tax loophole is his immoral tax scam. That said, widespread avoidance is a bad thing because it generates a culture of envy and disapproval of wealth creation. It enables the wealthy to decide how their tax dollars are spent. The philanthropic break means if I'm Getty, I can decide to spend it on X. Well, I might want to spend my tax dollars on the army and nothing on housing benefit. I have an Irish colleague who wants to spend all of it on housing benefit and nothing on the army. Rightly, we don't get that choice. And I think in a democracy, every citizen pays into the bundle. It's economically efficient. I do agree with the video about some of the multinationals, Google, Facebook, Starbucks, Amazon, pay virtually not a bean in this country through creative accounting and through what's known as the double Irish involving the Cayman Islands. I blame the government. Successive chancellors have given tax breaks to their pet projects, whether it's films, mortgage interest, pensions, growing timber, farming fields, which create complexity, loopholes, and the scope and incentive to tax avoidance. And all those breaks do disproportionately benefit the rich. My remedies. One, chances to cut radically the number of tax breaks. Fewer breaks, lower rates. Two, a minimum effective tax rate for anyone over earning over £100,000. Doesn't matter whether it comes in capital, income, all the avoidance. You pay an X percent rate on the money you get in. Three, tax things that are hard to avoid. An extra band or two on council tax wouldn't hurt. Four, don't get moralistic, get even. If you think somebody's tax avoiding, avoid them. Drink at Costas, not Starbucks. Costas pay tax. Finally, stop worrying too much about tax. It is a heavy blunt instrument that is fairly ineffective at reducing inequality. Except in America, the ghastly word pre-distribution, an efficient state delivering public services well focused, is much better for social mobility and for reducing inequalities. Focus your spending on the poor and the young rather than on universal goodies for the old, which means childcare, early intervention, effective schools, training that works, financial education, public health, Keep on attacking cartels and cosy restrictive practices, whether in the public sector, choice anyone, or the private sector, and that way you will get a fairer society. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Rowena. I'm a freelance journalist. I earn about the average wage, which is the last time I checked, about 22 grand a year, which isn't very much money. And every year I fill in my tax return form, and I get really quite excited because the more tax I pay, the more pleased that I am for two reasons. The first one is kind of a moral righteous reason about feeling that I'm contributing to the economy, I'm helping to build roads and hospitals and schools and that gives me a great sense of pleasure and pride. But the second is much more self-interested and that is the more tax I pay, the more I've earned. <laughs> and it always makes me think I should never pay less tax than the year before because otherwise I'm going downhill. And so I come to the tax debate with that kind of idea in mind, a lot of us look at it as a very negative thing, whereas actually I think we should be looking at it as a positive way that we contribute to a society and be proud of the community that we are building together. To go to the actual heart of the question, can a tax system build a fairer society, there's kind of two ways of taking it. The first is a conceptual one, you know, is it possible theoretically to build a fairer society in academic terms um, through the tax system? And the second one is a more practical one about whether there's the political will to make it happen. So even if we could create it theoretically, could we politically do it at this time? And if I take that first, uh, the, the, the last one first, and just look at whether it's politically possible, I'd say we're at an incredibly precious and important moment right now. Never has there been so much consensus, as Tim said, about the need to clamp down on tax avoidance, um, despite what Dominic said and it's quite interesting to see even the conservative party competing over who can crack down on tax avoidance the most i remember when it was quite a radical thing to say to say that we need to look at loopholes in the tax system some people might disagree with you and say it might just be creating wealth now even george osborne is saying we need to look at this particular process it's on the front page of many of the papers i read in the daily mail their editorial outrage at Starbucks paying just 8.6 million in tax in 14 years. That seems an incredibly tiny amount of money. 
Or I read in the Times today about the outrage of eBay um, avoiding 50 million pound tax and IKEA avoiding more. And also about Facebook paying incredibly little as well. But I think the most shocking fact of this weekend came from the Observer. How many companies in the top FTSE 100 list have subsidiaries in tax havens? The answer is 98 out of 100 are using tax havens regularly. So that's the practical point. On the conceptual point, the point of whether there is anything we can do to put this will into action, I think that's also true. You know, I agree with Lydia here on that. Three really basic things that we can do. The first is to tax economic activity where it is based. So if you buy a coffee in Starbucks down the road, you have to pay tax on it in the UK and not in the Cayman Islands where they may be based. The second is to have a more progressive system of taxation. I agree with Dominic there on example the council tax ban. In this country, if you have a house worth two million pounds, you say pay the same council tax as if you had a house worth 200 million. That doesn't seem fair to me at all. And the third thing that we could do is to tax wealth rather than income. And the interesting thing about all of those examples that I've just given you is that they are good for the economy as well as for our social justice system. How is my independent producer supposed to compete with Starbucks down the road on a fair and level playing field if Starbucks have got means to siphon off their profits in separate tax havens and so they have to take less of their profits away in tax? Similarly, if you're going to tax uh, like wealth rather than income, you should be that, that's a way of taxing idleness rather than people's incentives to work. It makes economic sense as well as moral sense. The only obstacle that we have to this, and I say this as a Labour Party councillor, is the Conservative Party are more interested in powerful interests than they are in values or in economics. Um, a lot of the time, the free market rhetoric that we get from that party is simply an ideology which is posing for something that's quite economically inefficient. One of the things that was really not talked about, for example, in the budget is why they decided to cut corporation tax rather than um, employment contributions for small firms. Corporation tax is a benefit for the largest companies in our country. It does not help the small business people who employ most of us in this country. The decision to raise the 50p rate rather than to cut VAT is another example of that. And the reason why I'm in the Labour Party is because I believe that the party of the left is more likely to take drastic, dramatic action that we need. One final point, and it is actually in favour of what Dominic was saying, is that although the tax system can be reformed and should be reformed to make social justice happen, it can't do everything. Obviously, I came from a party that's taxed and spent a huge amount of this country's money for a long time, and it didn't do everything that we needed it to. We need to also look at rewiring our economy, looking at companies before we have to start looking at tax rearrangements to reform corporate governance so that the structures that you get in the beginning are more fair and we have to rely less on the tax system to redistribute what is ultimately an unfair system of wages that happened in the beginning. Thank you very much for listening. Just to, to take a step back for a moment from the discussion, I think we need to recognise that at a global level, inequality has actually been reduced over the, the recent period and that the emergence of China and India and other developing countries has uh, made the gap between the rich countries and the, and the poorer countries less. So that, that, that's quite an important development. The paradox is that many of the forces which have enabled the, those countries to emerge in the way that they have have also led to increased inequality within countries, both in the emerging countries but also in places like Britain. So globalization has massively increased markets and meant that big companies and the rich people who own and control them have had ac access to much, uh, to much bigger markets and been able to make more money. Uh, financialization has uh, enabled capital to move much more freely uh, around the world. And you know, uh, London is one of the places which has most benefited from that, but likewise has encouraged the growth of the super rich and within the, the city where we are of the banking and financial community in general. 
So there's a paradox there, and it's not all negative, because I think we should all recognize that the emergence of millions and millions of people out of poverty, absolute poverty, in developing countries is a very good thing. What lies behind the, uh, I know Dominic doesn't like this word, but what lies behind the, the uh, focus on taxation at the moment is a sense of unfairness. I think that's really uh, what it is. And I think that the, the focus is on unfairness and thus on taxation has increased as the prospects for growth in our economy have decreased. And what we really got is this idea of, uh, I would call it, sharing out the misery a bit more fairly. You know, that we, we don't really believe that we can grow our economy, and the reason we don't believe it is because the people who run our society, politicians and businessmen, really do have not any idea of how to turn the UK and other Western countries into growth economies again, even after four or five years in, into the recession. And so we are all becoming more and more uh, focused on sharing out a smaller pie more fairly. And I think that that's really the wrong kind of discussion that we should be having. I mean, the reality is that social inequality decreases in growth economies. That's the only, the only uh, time that you really do get uh, more social mobility uh, and more opportunities being taken by more people. And you only have to look at China to know that there are hundreds of millions of people in China who are going to be better off than their parents ever were. And that's because they live in a growth economy. And we are not going to be able to raise the living standards of uh, everybody in this country by sharing out a smaller and smaller pie. I think there's a, a, another question about taxation as well, two more things. Firstly, um, I would like to see more of a focus on where the tax is being spent rather than how it's being gathered, because I think that the, the, you know, the state, even despite the, the tax avoidance and everything that's going on, still represents 47% of the UK economy. I don't think we're getting value for money in this. And to give the, the state access to even more funds when they don't really know what they're doing with a lot, lot of the money that they are collecting at the moment doesn't seem to me to be a useful way out of the, of, of the problems that we've got. And the last point really is that what worries me about the focus on tax avoidance, which we should just remind ourselves is completely legal, nobody's breaking any laws here, is that it seems that paying tax becomes a moral question and almost a voluntary issue. You know, that really what we're saying is that rich people should, should be just paying more tax because it's the right thing to do not because they are legally obliged to do so. If there are tax loopholes, then they should be closed. There's no question about that, in my mind. Uh, you know, and I, I, I'm not an expert on taxation law, but I think there are ways and means you could do that. But to make it an issue of morality is, in a way, taking us down the same road as many of the countries like Greece, where tax paying is effectively uh, voluntary, apparently. Uh, rather than it being subject to the rule of law. Now, you know, Dominic asked a question about ISIS. I would also say, you know, if George Osborne introduced a, a cut in income tax next week, how many people would pay that extra money that they'd save voluntarily? There's no evidence that that's ever happened in the history of the income tax. Okay, there's one guy there. Thank you very much for your contribution. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, that is not what happens. People are happy to pay tax if they think that it's a fair and legal system and they go along with it. But you know, to, to turn it into a voluntaristic moral issue is, in a way, quite a dangerous road to go down. I'm going to address the issue more directly. Everybody in politics nowadays says they want a fair tax system. In fact, I think the little slogan at the Liberal Democrats' recent conference was fair, fairer taxes in difficult times or something like that. Even the Conservatives say that their tax policy is motivated by fairness. So it's worth asking yourself, what, what would a fair tax system look like? Because the very strange thing about all these people who go on about fairness is they never say what they mean by it. They have no theory, they have no apparent theory of what makes a tax system fair, except an intuition that it's always fair, fairer if it's more progressive. So you know the minute somebody starts saying, I want a fairer tax system, what they mean is I want it to be more progressive. 
but you don't really kind of understand exactly why. What's the basic idea of uh, fairness or justice that's at work here? So let's just go run through a few uh, quickly and see what, what they tell you about tax and what you should do. I'm going to do three. Uh, one is uh, a very standard view of fairness is that you should treat people equally. And that, that's quite a common idea. What would, that, what would you do in tax if you're going to treat people equally? Well, we're all equally citizens and we're all equally uh, able to make use of the, uh, serve the public goods that taxation funds. So on that principle, we ought all to pay the same amount of tax. Right? That would be the equal treatment of people under tax system. So we should have a poll tax, a flat amount. That's not very progressive. But maybe that's not the principle that these people have in mind. Maybe they think, for example, we should all make an equal contribution to society. Perhaps that's the idea at work. Actually, quite interestingly, this has, this has a very odd implication for tax, if you believe that, which is that you should have inversely proportional tax. So the higher your income, the lower the rate of tax you should pay. And here's why. In fact, you should probably get a rebate. If you make money, uh, if you make a lot of money, then you've already done society a lot of good. Whenever you enter into a free transaction with somebody in a free market, they must value what you've offered higher than the price you're charging them for it. If they didn't value it more, they wouldn't buy it. Right? The difference between their willingness to pay for it and what they do pay is called consumer surplus. And so whenever you enter into a transaction that's voluntary, there's consumer surplus and supplier surplus. Both parties benefit a little bit, at least, from the transaction. If you become rich in a free market, what that means is that you have provided an enormous quantity of consumer surplus. So you've already done society a tremendous amount of good. You've made a huge contribution to society, and you're already, you shouldn't pay any tax, or you should probably get a rebate, because you've already made so much bigger contribution than most people. So you don't want to go down, if that's your view of justice, that everyone should make an equal contribution, you don't want, you want to go that way. The final one, the one I think probably people have at the back of their minds, is just the Marxist theory of justice, which is from each according to his ability to each according to his need. That, you can see, would motivate progressive taxations, large transfers of wealth, and so on. But the problem with that, uh, that rationale for, for the tax system that we have currently, the progressive one, is that the most needy people uh, are not British. Uh, no one in Britain's very poor by international standards. If you really think that justice requires transfers from those who can to those who need, then it should almost all be in foreign aid. All tax, and almost everybody in Britain should be paying taxes that are transferred to the truly poor overseas. And yet I never hear uh, anyone, even on the left, claiming that uh, this is what we ought to do. Money ought to be transferred according to them from the wealthy in Britain to the relatively less wealthy in Britain, even though the relatively less wealthy in Britain are massively more wealthy than the truly poor people in foreign countries. Uh, now, I don't, I don't believe the Marxist theory of justice, but I'm saying I don't, I don't understand what ideas about justice motivate the idea that it's fairer to have a more progressive tax system. And I think that it's disingenuous. I don't think the people who peddle these ideas really believe it. In fact, they've hardly even thought about it, as far as I can tell. I think that it's just, you know, in, in their interests in various ways. So, you know, it's in a politician's interest on the whole to transfer from a wealthy minority to a less wealthy majority. It's a, it's a vote winner. And then they dress it up in moral language, in the language of fairness. But it's an after-the-fact rationale for a policy that is advantageous for them. I just put a seed of an idea. It, until we had universal suffrage, until everybody could vote, when it was just a tiny minority of people who voted, mainly land-owning men, it was taken for granted that flat taxes were required by justice, that any departure from that principle was clearly unfair because you were treating people unequally. When, we, when countries around the world all started to get um, universal suffrage at about the same time, it took roughly 20, 30 years to go from flat taxes to incredibly progressive taxes. It took no time at all. It was an instant reaction to the change in the electoral system. Thank you.
Dominic, you talked about the Laffer curve and the fact that there's, there's this, um, uh, the idea that if you increase taxes um, by too much, then everyone will become less productive. They won't want to work that, um, more. It's really important to have a discussion about what is the optimum size of the state. But it's very important that people understand that a discussion about tax avoidance is not a discussion about the optimum size of the state. Because avoiding your taxes is not expressing a view that government is too big. The correct place it, to express that view is at the ballot box. Avoiding your taxes is turning around to all the small businesses and all the sort of low-income people who can't afford to hire, as I've said, an army of accountants and lawyers, turning around to them and saying, thanks for picking up my share of the tab. So they're two entirely separate discussions. Jamie, I wanted to just, before I hand over to Rowena, I wanted to, to come back on your point that you said there was no real collective sort of vision and theory about what makes a tax system fair. And I wanted to give one example of what I think makes a tax system fair. And that's that taxes are paid in the country where that economic activity actually takes place. And to give an example of that, I want to just very briefly describe how multinational corporations minimize their tax bill and avoid their taxes. What they do is, is, say you've got a company that, I don't know, makes clothes, and let's say it's based in India, and all its staff and all its activity will occur in India. And what it will do, it'll then set up a shell company, so a company that's not much more than an address, possibly one employee, in somewhere like the Cayman Islands, and it will assign that subsidiary something very difficult to put a value on, like property rights or a logo. And so the clothes will all be manufactured in India by all these people employed in India. And that Indian subsidiary will then have to buy the right to use the logo from the Cayman Islands subsidiary. And because it's very difficult to value how much you know, something like the, the Nike logo is worth, it's a very easy way to transfer large amounts of money away from the place where the activity occurs um, into a country where you've essentially just got a, a post box. Um, so I think that's a very basic idea about what, what sorts of things um, make a tax system fair. Um, I just want to come back on the issue that Dominic raised in the beginning about whether tax is a moral issue at all. In my opinion, it absolutely and completely is, and morality should guide our tax policy to a certain extent. When you set up a company in this country, you need the roads that we all provide collectively to drive on, you need healthy workers with a health service, you need the education system, you need the police force to keep your company secure. You use all of those goods and without those goods you couldn't have a company in that particular country. And when you, when you don't pay your tax as a powerful company, or when you avoid it through certain leap, loopholes, you make other people pick up the bill for you, which means that my local independent coffee company is now paying for the services that Starbucks will use. It doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem right, and to me, that's a moral question. And also, the idea that you know, there's no moral basis for people who are richer paying more than people who are poorer doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Of course, people with the broadest shoulders should carry the biggest burden. Of course. I don't, even, I don't even understand why we have to explain this to Jamie. If you're talking about vested interests, if like the Labour Party has a vested interest in just looking after poorer people, I, I'm really not sure if it's a, as great an interest as it is for more powerful people, companies who spend a huge amount of money lobbying. Poor people certainly don't do that. They're also certainly a lot less likely to vote and turn out in elections. It comes from a moral stake that we have in wanting to make our society a better and fairer place. Finally, on Rob's point about growth, and actually what we should worry about less is the taxation system and more about just getting growth back in the economy. There's a really interesting report done by the Resolution Foundation. And what it says is, assuming there's 2.5% growth going up in the economy until 2015, um, the poorest half of the economy will still be 15% worse off than they are today. And that's because of rising prices in the economy and the way that our payment, the company's payment structures work, which pay the poorer half a lot less than the top. The, the, all of the proceeds of growth will go to the richer half unless we look at how our tax system is structured and how our companies are structured as well. The thing I don't understand about the, the, the argument on morality is what place it, it, it plays in this discussion. I mean, the discussion of, of a tax structure and legal enforcement of a tax structure is a decision that's made through the democratic process and through the legal system. 
What does it help us to say that there is something moral or immoral about the way that the tax system is enforced? It's either enforced, in which case it works, or it's not enforced, in which case it doesn't work. What is the point of the morality discussion? I really don't get it. Are we supposed to be shaming rich people into paying tax? Is that, is that it? Because I think if we're going to, if that's going to be our policy of trying to get more tax, I think that's not likely to be very effective. A more effective tax regime, cutting down the loopholes, I can understand that, but I don't understand what morality has got to do with it. You know, the, the question of morality is probably t should take place when we are having our public discussion about where to spend the money, right? That makes sense to me. You know, we, we decide that education is important or health is important or, or whatever. But in what sense is it going to help us to make the rich feel bad about themselves? And honestly, I don't know how many rich people you know, but uh, one of the things that uh, I think is least likely to work with them is shame. You know, other, other things might. Shame is not very likely. I find it odd that you think moral principles, your redistributive principles, don't require uh, any, any justification, um, that they're just kind of obvious. They haven't been obvious to people through great periods of history. They're not obvious to me. They're not obvious to a lot of people I know. They need a defense. Uh, and they particularly need a defense when you don't actually believe them yourself. Because if you really did believe in the principle that those with the broadest shoulders, to use the metaphor, uh, should supply the money and it should go to those with the greatest needs, then all the money should go offshore. It should all go to needy, very poor foreigners. Yet that's not what's being suggested. So even you don't believe it. You've got like that principle with a bizarre nationalist overlay. But the moral principle clearly has nothing to do with borders or what country you happen to be a citizen of. It seems like a perfectly general human principle. So I, I don't think uh, even you believe it. So it surely needs justification. It is also important to note, and I think there's something that's going on, that all this talk about tax avoidance is quite alarming. Uh, tax avoidance, you might mean get, simplify the tax code so there are fewer loopholes. But I don't think that is what's meant because uh, Lydia suggested that the government ought to employ more people at, at the Tax Collection Bureau in order to clamp down on avoidance. Now remember, avoidance is legal. So what are these people going to be doing? They're going to be violating the rule of law. The, the government has recently uh, decided to do this. This is something called the general anti-avoidance rule that they're bringing in, under which you won't know how much tax you owe. You can obey the law, and the government can say, we don't mind that you've obeyed the law, you're paying more tax. Right? You, should be, you should not want to clamp down on tax avoidance. You may want to clamp down tax evasion, which is breaking the laws, or you may want to restrict the opportunities for tax avoidance by changing the law. But the idea that you're going to clamp down on tax avoidance is to say that we are deviating from the principles of the rule of law we are going to exempt taxation from the normal constraints under which the government cannot act against you unless you've broken a law. I stand corrected. There is morality in the tax debate. That is immoral. Sorry, Lydia, I, I do disagree with you on the icy point. Jimmy Carr, to name, to name at random, took advantage of a door that the government had deliberately left open. Chancellors wanted to support the film industry, so they gave it a tax break, and Jimmy Carr took pretty aggressive advantage of that tax break. You are on a, a pragmatic spectrum, and I agree with Jamie that that spectrum ends where the law says it ends. What the Chancellors need to be doing is making the law tougher. That should be a decision for all of us, but it should make the law tougher, not come down on people who are obeying the law. The tricky bit about all this is the, the globalised economy we live in, because you can cut down loopholes in your own society, but you're still going to deal with the Starbucks, the Ebays, the Facebooks of this world. Part of that is because of tax havens, and I agree strongly with Lydia. I don't know why people haven't come around in the G20 to, to get at that. And I still, I'm asking, I still haven't had an answer for my own company. We don't need that many companies to support the local banking needs of inhabitants of Guernsey. But with globalised companies, Starbucks make their tax avoidance without having to use the Cayman Islands. They do intra-company profit charging from wherever the lowest corporate rates of taxes are. So they've got a warehouse in the Netherlands which has got lower things. Their coffee is officially shipped through that. 
they pay a patent fee. What the hell is patented about Starbucks to America? 6% because the corporation taxes or corporate taxes are lower there. You just shovel it out. That is a really difficult problem for us to grapple with. Final point, Rowena mentioned the Resolution Foundation. I declare an interest. I'm an alternate to my chairman on the Commission on Living Standards, which the Resolution Foundation is going to be bringing out their report on the 29th of October. Please read that report in this subject. My name is Daniel ben -Ami. I think there is a moral kernel to this discussion because I think what is meant by fairness is very much the idea of shared sacrifice, that everyone should be prepared to make sacrifices. And in the conditions of poor economic growth, recession and so on, it's hardly a surprise that the rich and powerful in this society are pushing the idea of shared sacrifice. George Osborne, the Labour Party, multi-billionaire Warren Buffett, lots of other billionaires across Europe, in fact, Barack Obama. This, in fact, is the mainstream idea because they can't get their act together, they can't promote economic growth, so they just want to promote austerity. And the way that they can try and sell austerity to the general public is by saying, you know, you need to make sacrifices. Rich people need to make sacrifices. Poor people, too, need to make sacrifices. So the whole discussion of fairness, although it may sound radical and humanistic, it's actually a way of selling austerity and making it, it acceptable. It's not at all surprising that the Labour, the Labour Party or the Conservative Party should favour that because they have absolutely failed to promote economic growth in this country. It's not at all surprising that the New Economics Foundation should support that because it is essentially an organisation which promotes lower material living standards. And the more that they're against high living standards, the more they're very shrill about let's all make sacrifices, let's make life fair. Thank you. Could I have a show of hands again? I will tell you exactly why morality is important. Tax law is written with a certain intent. An intent to sort of leave certain loopholes open and those loopholes are written with the intent to be used for certain purposes. And those purposes are very clearly debated within Parliament. And to sort of use those tax avoidance loopholes for purposes outside the purpose for which they are intended, but may still be legally acceptable, that is a question of morality indeed. What I re find really annoying in this debate from the gentleman here is that it to me seems like I'm reading a conservative pamphlet and that the discussion is not about actual academic arguments. I think the answer to Jamie's point about why a Marxist wouldn't advocate um, giving large amounts of aid to redistribute wealth would be simply about democratic control. Um, if you believe in sovereignty and democracy, you don't necessarily support giving large amounts of wealth to people who would have no control over that. It would be like if a millionaire started bankrolling my family. I mean, I might go along with it, but I would be certainly uneasy about it, and it wouldn't necessarily be right or fair to do. Um, that having, having been said, I think part of the um, concentration on higher rate um, tax earners is partly to do with the fact that the political class won't look at um, raising basic rates of direct tax we seem to have ended up with a 20% basic rate of income tax, and that seems to be immovable. In fact, I think one of the reasons that Blair set up the 50% rate was because he didn't want to do what the Tories said he was going to do, which was to put up um, income tax at all. So from that point of view, I think that um, different rates of taxation are divisive because people start saying, oh, tax the rich, that'll sort out all our problems. I think there's... Um, an argument to be had that um, a flat rate of tax based on a proportion um, would actually allow a, a more sort of holistic debate about the proportion of, of, of wealth that should go into tax or income that should go into tax and that would, would, would lead us away from this kind of um, slightly lazy tax the rich and there'll be the sort of panacea. Thank you. Thank Just to quickly say I have no problem if a millionaire wants to bankroll my family. Um, but also, I think the Marxist defense of a non-globalized tax distribution system is a non-globalized tax collection system. And I think that is the defense of the argument you put. The point that Daniel made about austerity, I think, is, is very important. Because what the tax avoidance issue does is it offends the idea that we're all in this together. 
But that's assuming that you think that we're all in this together in the first place, which I don't. Right? I think, you know, in a, an economic recession is always going to hit different sections of the uh, population differentially. And particularly because of the complications, as I said at the beginning, of the impact of globalization and financialization. You know, that, that, that adds, makes the whole thing a very complex picture. It, it, it seems to me that the morality issue has become a substitute for politics, uh, actually, in this, in this whole discussion. Because really, I think what, and I, I don't want to characterize anybody unfairly, but I think, so I won't say it's the people in this, on this platform, but some people would you, are using the morality issue as a substitute for basically saying they don't like the rich. You know, in a different, in a different time, they would have been for the expropriation of the rich. They would have been socialists, and they would have put forward an alternative to capitalism, uh, and, and you know, that's what they would have been saying. And I think, you know, in a way, it'd be better in some ways if that's what was going on, but it isn't. What's going on is people who don't like capitalism but have no alternative to it are basically making a moral critique of, uh, uh, of some aspects of capitalism and basically stigmatizing the rich and stigmatizing wealth and wealth creation without having any alternative in, a, in, a, in, a, in the sense of a program for economic growth. So it, this, this goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. Tax avoidance, even if we fixed it, isn't going to help our economy to start growing again. It isn't, right? It's just not going to. I mean, you know, some, we, we, could be, we could do with spending some of our public spending in a more helpful way to growing the economy by channeling resources into more productive parts of the economy. That's true. But, you know, that's, at the moment, that the question of tax avoidance is neither here nor there in the bigger scheme of things. And I think it has become a substitute, a lazy substitute, for trying to think of serious ways of getting out of the economic recession. The thing is that on a fundamental level, if you live in this nation, we are all in this together in the sense that we do use the same roads and have the same transport and education and health systems. And so we do have to find a way collectively of paying for those things. The problem is that the way that our economy works often feels like we're not in it together because some people get rewarded a lot and some people don't get very much. And the point of the tax system, Rob, is to try and make sure that we can reconfigure that so that we do find a way of collectively paying for the things that we all share together. And that seems to be a fundamental point. On whether that's about hating rich people, I certainly don't think so. I mean, some of the richest people I know who do pay their tax properly are the people who are the most vehement critics of those who avoid it, because it gives them a bad name, and it means they're picking up their bill for things that they would otherwise be paying for. The wider point, Rob, about morality, um, which was also raised by the gentleman at the front, um, I think it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to give all of our money to poorer countries, partly because, like I said, we work as a nation where we share these collective goods together. Someone in Egypt is not using my roads that I'm paying for through my tax system or my education system or my health system, for example. We function as a democratic system, as this gentleman at the back pointed out. Um, on Daniel's point, I believe, at the front about shared sacrifice, I thought that was a very nice way of putting it, actually. Um, but to me, the question is not just whether we want growth. Of course we want growth. Of course we have to look at ways of delivering that. But it's also about what type of growth we want and we want, what we want to do with the proceeds of that growth. So do we want growth that goes in the form of profits or do we want growth that goes in the form of wages? Do we want growth that goes um, to the north or to the south, to the poorest or to the richest? And, and that to me is a moral question that's addressed, yes, by the tax system, but not just the tax system, by a whole set of other structures as well that I think we should look at. We could take an infrastructure, a road, to use a classic example. We're going to start building a lot of roads in uh, the UK now, apparently, or railways and so on, infrastructure investment. We could spend that on building roads in African countries. As recently an African country, got almost no decent roads. Trust me, we could easily spend the money in those countries. There are no barriers to doing that. Uh, so that, that's a completely bogus argument. To understand why we don't do it, it, and why we have taxes like we do, it start with the question of we're all in it together. I think that is a, a good way of starting this debate. If you had voluntary redistribution of wealth, which you do have, I mean, you know, I give money to my kids and so on, yeah, that's voluntary redistribution of wealth, you get, you, you discover who people care about, 
what groups they consider themselves to be in so that we're all in it together. My family is, we are all in it together. Right? Now, Rowena feels very, she's a very powerful nationalist. She says she feels good paying her taxes because she knows that money's going to go to other British people. She feels some kind of bond with the entire British nation that I don't. Right? Now, politicians and Rowena want to coerce me into acting as if I do. Right? They're going to take my money and give it to people. Uh, and the reason, now, they, why do they do it at the national level? This is very interesting. They don't go extra national. They don't, they don't transfer it to foreigners. They do it nationally. Why? It, it's obvious, because we have a national electoral system. They need to get the maximum votes across the country. Foreigners don't matter because they don't vote. It, it's, it's. Firstly, Daniel, obviously, just to very briefly um, respond to the point you made about that the, the my organization um, you think is, is all about um, sort of reducing living standards for everyone. I mean, I, I, I completely disagree with that. I mean, obviously, what my organization, I imagine what everybody here wants is that to achieve the highest um, you know, living standards for the greatest number of people. I think probably just Daniel and I disagree on, on the best way to get there. Um, well, but I don't, I don't turn this into a discussion about left. Let's, let's keep this about um, tax. Um, to respond to the point that's, that's come up a couple of times, this, this idea that, that a discussion about tax avoidance is a lazy substitute um, for trying to think about ways to get the country out of the recession. Um, well, firstly, I completely disagree with that. I think the fact that we have um, austerity measures, we're having to lose jobs left, right, and center at the same time as the private sector is, um, is not expanding itself, is, is dramatically trying to deleverage itself. I mean, this is the reason why we have a recession, um, and one of the reasons why we're having to, to, to cut jobs so much, uh, or, or the government feels this pressure to cut jobs, is because we are losing um, you know, tax left, right, and center from, from rich individuals and corporations. Now, I just want to, because I'm aware that we've been sort of, I've been quite sort of negative and, and very much kind of just criticizing a, a tax avoidance without putting forward any concrete, constructive ideas about what we can do about it. So I just want to give you three ideas now. The first one I, I, I touched on before, which is this idea about thinking about UK tax havens, thinking about um, the Cayman Islands, uh, Jersey, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, so on and so forth, and the fact that we do have the right to legislate and, uh, and to intervene in these jurisdictions. I think we need to think about that and the role that the UK plays in global tax avoidance. Secondly, um, we, uh, both Dominic and I have, br have briefly touched on this issue, this, this, this issue that there was this whitewash by the G20 leaders. Let, let me just go on to explain a little bit more about that. What they did, what they put in place and then went and declared that ta tax haven secrecy was no longer an issue, was they set, they set a very low bar. They basically said that tax havens um, could sign a, a very small number of what are called tax information exchange agreements with a few other countries, including with each other. And if they did this, they would then be taken off the tax haven blacklist. And the, sort of the day after this rule was implemented, there were no tax havens on this blacklist. That was how loose it was. And to give you an example of how ridiculous these tax information exchange agreements are, I mean, not only can they sign them with each other and they only need to sign a few, um, they're also, they're not an automatic exchange of information. Um, you have to, it, a tax authority needs to have a, a very specific idea of who a tax avoider is, what they're doing, and how they are doing it in order to get any information off a country like the Cayman Islands. So you basically need to know the answer before you can ask the question. Um, and uh, so, I mean, there's, there's t the G20 could really be doing a lot to actually put pressure on these nations, and there's no appetite to do it. So I want to give you an example of something that the international community could be doing um, in order to clear up this mess. And to go back to the example I gave before of the country, uh, the company based in India that does all its manufacturing and has all its, the vast majority of its staff employed in India, but declares its profits in somewhere like the Cayman Islands. Well, a way to make life really, really difficult for that company is to introduce something called country by country reporting. And what this would mean is that each multinational company would, on a country by country basis, have to break down you know, the number of staff employed in that company, the profits made in that, in that country, sorry, um, um, uh, and so on and so forth, the taxes paid in that country. And that would be declared on a country by country basis. So you could see if this company had all their staff employed in India and it appeared like all their economic activity was occurring in India, yet all their profits and their minuscule tax was actually paid in the Cayman Islands, this could be raised. Journalists could, for example, flag it to the general public and people could then choose to purchase the goods and services of another company. 
Now, you might think, oh, my goodness, but, you know, if the, if the UK did this, um, you know, every, all companies would leave the UK and, and you know, we'd, our economy would collapse. Um, well, I completely agree, and that's why people who are pushing for country-by-country country reporting are um, pushing it for, for it to be incorporated into international accounting standards. And if it was incorporated into international accounting standards, it would be enforced in over 100 countries. And, um, and sometimes you know, companies will turn around and say, oh, we don't have this information, it's, it's too expensive, we can't provide it. Well, yes, they do have this information. What kind of poorly run business doesn't know who they're employing where? Um, so those are just a few uh, concrete ideas on, on what we could be doing. First, a lot of this debate has been about, you know, it's because of austerity and it's the, re the recession, etc. Get over it, guys. It is not about the recession. It is about a much longer term and much longer lasting shift from west to east of global wealth. It is about globalization. It is about technology. Those are the forces that are driving rising inequality in most western states, within most western states. We need to address measures that address that. This debate has been bedeviled, I think, and I'll come back to my very first point, between fairness, the slippery concept that very few people in this room seem to be able to agree on, versus a more equal society, which is something that is measurable and demonstrable, and which is probably economically efficient. I would simply comment that Sweden has found, amongst all the European nations, the best way of fusing Rob's point with the points to our left, which is a state that is actually no larger than ours at the moment in terms of national wealth, but which is a damn sight more efficient and focused on where it delivers it to a particular social goal. It doesn't worry too much about tax, it worries about what it does with it. That's what matters. Final point on uh, tax, aversion, avoidance. I think I just came armed with one quote from the landmark judgment on tax avoidance, which I still think is correct. It's from Lord Justice Clyde. He says this, no man in the country is under the smallest obligation moral or other, so as to arrange his, arrange his legal relations to his business or property as to enable the inland revenue to put the largest possible shovel into his stores. I still think that's right. Thank you. I think this argument is hiding a greater point, which is that tax avoidance is legal. You might see it as a failure of taxation, but it's really a failure of government. And I think it's Milton Friedman who said he never met anyone who was defending a government program who said its evils didn't stem from the fact it wasn't bigger, it wasn't big enough. And that's what you're essentially saying. We must make HMRC bigger. This fantasy that if government's budget were to be doubled tomorrow, it would have twice as much outcomes. But it's the point, um, I forget your name, I was making about efficiency. The question is, what does government do with the enormous amount of money we give it every day? To Lydia, uh, you said in recession, the country is losing money and so we have to generate money and are you suggesting that we pay more tax to give the government and get nothing in return? I mean the, most of the discussion certainly from the floor has focused on tax avoidance, tax loopholes, that kind of thing. I mean the way I look at it is if there is all these problems it's quite a simple statement to make that the government should just sort it out. What worries me, however, is it's those issues that I think the government should just sort it out, doesn't have to hit, uh, you know, uh, uh, party conference headlines and discussions about how are we going to do this or uh, all that can just happen. But the more important kind of questions that I would say that the government should be addressing, like how are we going to get the highest living standards, the kind of things that you mentioned, or next to you who said, yes, you are for growth. It's those kind of things which we always don't want to talk about. However, it's always there, the end of the sentence. We want tax avoidance. Of course we're for growth. We want this loophole to be closed or this part of the rich to pay this. Of course we are for high living standards, but we don't want to talk about it. And I appreciate this is a discussion on tax. But actually the reality of having a fairer society is a richer society, and a richer society means growth. And we do have to discuss how can we get this growth. And I think as the point was made right early on, if you look at the East, China, India, even the other side of the world, uh, Brazil, they have all reduced poverty through real economic development. And I would say if we just spent half the time worrying about that and how do we get that in this country, we'd be better off. 
I have to admit there's some confusion. Uh, I'm a high rate taxpayer. Uh, I run an SME. We, we pay our corporation tax. And, and I should be on this side of the argument, really, because I love paying taxes, because I think schools, hospitals, and roads are good things as well. But I hate this moralistic, though, shall pay your taxes. I just think it's divisive. If, if you took a, a tract from the, the 1970s where everybody blamed the immigrants for taking our jobs and crossed out immigrants taking our jobs and wrote in rich people not paying their taxes, you'd have exactly the same kind of divisive uh, approach to, to uh, what the problem is that, that, that comes out from all, from all, this, all this moralistic uh, way that it, it's presented. I think Lydia's absolutely wrong when she said there's a black and white difference between ISAs uh, and legal tax avoidance. It, th th there is no black and white difference. There's lots of shades of grey. And if I make tax savings that lets me take on two new apprentices, who's to say that's wrong? You know, who's to say that that's morally uh, questionable? I think the, the real thing is that what we're, what we're missing from all this is any kind of a vision. And, and when uh, uh, Rob talked about, you know, oh, we need to... Uh, um, uh, uh, refocus on growth. I mean, it's kind of hard to get excited about that. And, and, and it seems to me that if we had something that was a, a, a bit more um, vision-like about, you know, let's put a man on Mars, you know, let, let's have some real <coughs> talk about real growth, not fannying around, around the edges, you know, let's, let's really get some, some, some proper uh, discussion about growth going. Um, on the other hand, I think Lydia's absolutely right that we do need to employ more people in our tax offices. Um, we can't even ca collect the tax that's due efficiently now. Uh, uh, government can't organise tax collection in tax offices, uh, which is problematic. Thank you. Um, something that I think is quite interesting and, and worth flagging is we've, we've heard a couple people today talk about the emerging economies and talking about the growth we've seen in China, in India and Brazil. And I think a really important point to note about the growth in those countries is that all three of those countries don't believe that sort of the free movement of money and the free movement of the wealth is the best way to get growth. Um, all three of those countries implement various forms of, of things called, um, economists call them capital controls, but they're basically things that don't allow the completely free movement of capital. They basically think that, the, that you know, they've watched things like the, the Southeast Asian um, crisis, which occur, uh, occurred in the, the 1990s, and they, they noted the fact that sort of all the Southeast Asian economies, bar Malaysia, which actually put in place um, restrictions on the movement of capital and survive the best. The others got into a complete state and these countries have noticed it and they absolutely do not, uh, do not just allow money to sort of go, go where it will. Um, so this, this, this idea that sort of not discussing the, the role of the state in the economy is sort of the, the best way to get growth because that's what sort of China, India and Brazil have done is, is, is just not true. Very briefly, I just want to take up this gentleman's point about waste. Um, and as someone who, who pays their taxes, um, I hate the idea that, there is, that it's going to wasteful issues. I mean, particularly when, for example, we were at the war in Iraq, it was much more painful to pay my taxes than otherwise. But I think we have to separate out the issue of waste, which we're all against, with the issue of tax avoidance. Because even once we've cut out all of that waste, whatever you might think it is, we're still going to collectively, as a society, have to pay for those national goods that I was talking about. And the question is, who, is, who pays for those? And, and actually, that we should all contribute to paying for them, not just having a few pay for them. Um, on the issue of, and that relates to the lady's question at the back, which was, how does it make us a fairer society if all we're paying for is collective public goods? Well, it seems to me that if we do have roads and hospitals and schools, and poorer people are paying for them, and poorer business people are paying for them, but richer corporations aren't, uh, it leaves us a more unfair society. That's quite a regressive distribution of wealth. Um, on the question, finally, about going back again to where the morality comes in, I think I do actually agree with Rob in that we do have to reform our tax system so that we have morality hardwired into it in the beginning. If we think that avoidance is wrong, um, we, then we have to make it into an, act, an active case of evasion and change the law systematically and then make everybody do the same thing rather than allowing them to do it legally and then punishing them retrospectively afterwards. I, I would much prefer we had morality hardwired into the system earlier. So on that point, I think we do agree. And, and also the lady's point here, which I, which I do understand, like you don't just want people you know, bashing others. I think that would help that point, if we just corrected the law in the first place, we wouldn't have to have the moral outrage afterwards when they do something that's legal but a little bit distasteful. Um, and I hope that we would 
spread that disdain to anyone who was um, evading tax, not just to the very richest, but also to poorer people who were um, evading it as well. I think we should be equally sure that no people should be evading tax and making others pick up the bill. I very quickly want to make a suggestion that I hope my other side will like. To get rid of a lot of these problems of tax avoidance, if you think they're a problem, you should simply abolish corporation tax. Corporation tax is, corporates aren't people, right? So any profit that a corporation makes eventually ends up in individuals' pockets. It either goes to higher wages for the staff, goes to the shareholders, or lower prices for consumers, right? So if you tax corporations, all that happens is certain individuals end up eventually paying that tax. If you don't tax them, they, they, they'll pay it another way. They'll have a higher income, they'll pay the tax then. Uh, in fact, corporation tax is well known to be a very bad kind of tax economically because it, it discourages productive investment. Uh, so, but also, a corporation being a huge agglomeration of wealth that has enormous resources to put into tax avoidance, as we've heard, is more likely to engage in it than are the people who would get the money if it weren't taxed from the corporations, the individual shareholders of the companies and so on. So a very effective way of reducing uh, tax avoidance without reducing tax take is to switch ta taxes from corporation tax to consumption tax and uh, personal income tax. I think one observation about the thing that hasn't raised itself in the room, yeah. most people have talked about public spending and taxes for public spending. It's jolly good because it pays for the things that help growth along schools, hospitals, roads. We all use those. Actually, 50% of tax take is a transfer payment. It's from you to you, or you to you, or from across the generations. And it is done in a stunningly inefficient way. You would actually do a lot more to get growth if we're talking about suggestions, quite like abolishing corporation tax and uh, sticking it on consumption. You would do a lot more similarly if you put it on the young, it transfers to the young and the poor who actually need it rather than, I don't know, free television licenses for everybody over 75? My old mum can afford a television license, no problem. And yet we spend an awful lot of our time transferring tax and narrowing the tax base, which brings you back to tax avoidance because the, more the, the smaller the base, the higher the rate, the greater the incentive to avoid. Thank you. At the Conservative Party conference, David Cameron thanked the army, the volunteers, the athletes, the media, so why didn't he thank the uh, people who coughed up the nine billion to pay for it? And whilst we're at it, if you want to go after Philip Green and Top Shop and Vodafone, do you want a high street full of boarded up shops? And the lady in the uh, pink jacket and the pink, pink pullover said, you earn 23 grand. Well, if you had a job that paid 58 grand a year, like me, who drives a white van around, I don't think you'd um, be so keen on paying your taxes. Not at 44% you wouldn't. And as for Jimmy Carr and Harry Redknapp and Philip Green, well, for people who lay bricks, dig gardens, look after babies, they're heroes. You know, you want Robin Hood government, well, I'm gonna ask you a question. Who's the Sheriff of Nottingham? And the other question is, you said corporation tax ends up in the hands of the uh, individual. Well, 75p in every pound ends up in the hands of the tax man. So don't you all think we have been taxed enough? There's been a lot of talk about um, the tax laws and the tax system and how um, we define you know, what tax avoidance is. But I think the reality of it, uh, once we look at the long running, um, the trend of changes in the tax system is that we live in we live in a country where we hold parliamentary sovereignty in very high regard and no tax law is ever entrenched and we never have we never have any uh, we always have a very changing definition of what fairness is and what morality is so in response to when you say the G20 should do more um, and there shouldn't be any white walling of interlock uh, interlocking financial markets and we should um, abolish all these tax havens. Don't we need to, under, uh, or at least acknowledge that different countries have different um, definitions of what a tax avoider is and corporations that do avoid tax. And some of them might even want to have uh, you know, tax havens. And in that case, or, or following that logic, 
you know, uh, global politics to reduce inequality or reduce tax avoidance in, uh, in such a global level will never work. I just want to say that I'm just um, astonished by the two, you two at the end. Um, I, just, I don't know where you get the idea that we're all in it together. I don't know why you keep talking about, you know, we have to do this, this and this to... I, I think we aren't all in it together and I'm astonished that you're so sure that we are all in it together and that I'm, I'm much older than you and I'm also astonished by your complete lack of imagination. I mean, even, what's his name with the bald head at this end? He had a nice idea about, you know, why don't they just you know, send, send money from here to the, the poor world, and you go, oh, no, 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 we can't do that, because we're all nationalists. And I'd really like to know if you've got any better ideas besides fiddling around with the sodding tax system in terms of how to get growth. Yeah, I don't know if it's, because uh, I came in halfway through, I don't know if it's already been raised, but surely one of the ways of, of dealing with tax avoidance is simply to tax things that can't avo be avoided. And uh, I'm, 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 I think there are a lot of problems with the Liberal Democrats' proposed mansion tax, I mean, I live in a garage, and I might be eligible for it. So, uh, you know, it, it, in, in the southeast and in London, tiny flats uh, are, are worth 1.5 to 2 million, and people can be house rich and cash poor. But surely the essential point that Vince Cable has made is you can't hide a mansion in a tax haven. You can't avoid it. And the rich should be more. It's absolutely obvious. The bankers got us in this mess with their huge bonuses, and they damn well ought to help get us out of it. The first gentleman kind of uh, brought up the idea that if we kind of, you know, go after tax avoiding um, corporations like this, then we're just going to have um, lots of boarded up shops in the high streets. But I think if you kind of look at the, the three sort of points I outlined, like looking at the role of UK tax havens um, in the context of global tax avoidance, um, getting the G20 to do something meaningful together, and introducing things like country by country reporting, um, you know, I, I, I don't see how any of those things would, would lead to boarded up shops on the high, on the high streets. Um, and in fact, if you want to look at, at how, um, you know, how we can help boost uh, small, small businesses, well, one of the things to do that is, is uh, you know, e ease the burden on, um, on, on their tax share. And obviously, if you've got the, you know, the people with the broader shoulders in society um, running away from their share of the tab, you know, if you've got to pay for a school, that means it increases the burden on, on, on the small businesses. So um, I, you know, I, I completely disagree with that premise. Um, on, the, on the point that, that um, you know, that our ideas of justice will always be changing, you know, absolutely, completely agree, and I completely agree that there'll be different perceptions of what makes a just society in different countries in the world. What really frustrated me about the G20 debate is I think the, uh, the message that our political leaders put forward to, to the populations uh, in, in these countries w was very different to what they'd actually done. So if you look at the, you know, the, the average person in a lot of these countries, if you take the US, for example, which is, you know, I think generally we would assume to be much more right-wing than somewhere like the UK, and if you look at all the kind of... Um, you know, discussion at the moment about Mitt Romney and his tax avoidance and, the, you know, uh, his businesses in the Cayman Islands and so on and so forth. Like, this is a really big issue even in a country like the US. Like, this is something that the British population care about. It's something that the American population care about. Um, it's something that we all feel really strongly about and we were lied to because, you know, Gordon Brown and Sarkozy and everyone turned around and said, oh, we've dealt with it. We've come down really hard on these tax, evasions, uh, tax havens and they just lied, um, which is why I'm so frustrated with those negotiations. Um, and then on, on the context of, um, so I'll be really quick, final point on the, um, the context of, of, of um, tax havens and poor countries, because we've been talking about, oh, you know, let's, um, you know, g g give money to poor countries and so on and so forth. Um, tax havens actually result in poor, developing countries losing more revenue, more taxes than they get in as, um, as international aid from donors, including uh, other nation states. And there's, there's um, research from organizations like Christian Aid that, that prove this. So, so tax havens are not just a problem for countries like the, the UK, they're actually a blight on the world's poor as well. Okay, uh, I think I will finish with where I came in. You need to be clear what you want from your tax system. And I would say you want three things. Equality, and I agree we are not all in this together. Mitt Romney made the point appallingly badly, but he's right that 47% of Americans don't net pay tax. They're not all in it together. You want efficiency, which means, I, think, I like Jamie's idea about corporation tax, one which will take away. It means fewer breaks. It means things like taxing things that don't move. And you want effectiveness to be growth friendly in a global economy. Thank you. Quickly, I just want to go back to the question that we were asked, which is, um, you know, can we tax our way to a fair society? I'd say that yes, we can, and absolutely we should. And the vast majority of people in this country, whether they're left or right wing, 
would actually agree with that proposition. To, the ideal scenario would be to change the law so that it's possible to tax avoid on a way that we think is immoral. Um, but in those circumstances where we haven't changed the law, I think it's perfectly fine to morally shame those companies who do do things that we're, that we're worried about. Partly because, let's remember, a lot of companies make a lot of money on the reputation for being moral, credible companies. They encourage us to go into their stores on the basis that they are moral and they do care about us. So when they don't act by those principles, I think we're perfectly capable of punishing them for it. Um, just a couple of specifics. The woman at the back, I'm really sorry you thought you were disappointed with the conversation we had. If the topic had been about growth, I can assure you I've got an awful lot of um, suggestions about how we can go about that, and I'd be really happy to talk to you afterwards. And the gentleman at the back who earns over 50 grand a year and pays more tax than me, I'd still be very happy to swap with you, sir. Thank you. A fairer society isn't, isn't particularly useful for anybody if it's a poorer society. And I, I, and I think that the, you know, the, the focus on, on fairness is the wrong public discussion, the wrong national discussion for us to be having at the moment. Uh, you know, we, if we, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not antisocial, and I, you know, and I do believe in society, and I believe that it, we should have, uh, we should set national goals, and we should expect our political leaders to execute, and so on and so on. But they should be under much more pressure. But rather than sharing out a smaller pie more equally, they should be working out how to create a bigger pie that we then, then have a discussion about how we use those resources and everything else. It's the wrong discussion. And it's a kind of, it's a, it's a divisive and weedy form of redistributionism. That, that, you know, it's, it's, it's a sideshow to what's going on in both the global economy and the UK economy. It's a waste of time. And all it does is make, encourages people to feel more bitter and more envious rather than encouraging enterprise and self-interest, which is what we really need. I think everybody's got the gist of what I think. I'll just say one thing very quickly. I, I like tax havens uh, because they, they uh, make it very hard for governments to put, push up tax rates to predatory levels, and they kind of cap the size of government. It, it, it's basically just a form of competition uh, amongst... Uh, Mafia, uh, so you know they can't go up, to, and that's why they hate it, right? They they always all the government's trying to coordinate tax laws and so on, so that there's no constraint on how much they can prey on their citizens. So I'm really in favour of tax havens.